you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, we're just a little bit under the weather today with the old voice, so as promised, the Minor Prophets would be started. We're going to cancel it, and we're just going to visit a little bit. Very informal. There's a subject or two that I feel are extremely important, and they will happen in and to this generation. Therefore, it becomes paramount that you should understand the specifics of the Trumps. You see, in the Trumps, six of them are deception Trumps. They're going to deceive people. There's only one out of the seven that will um, not deceive anyone, and that's the last, for it will be the time of deception will have been passed. And we will have moved into that time that Christ is with us again. So, six of the first Trumps, one through six, are trumps of deception for all but God's elect. Nothing deceives God's elect, maybe for a moment. But it doesn't take that long if you're skilled in your Father's Word how to understand the trumps and the deception as well. So I'm going to center on the one trump for if you understand the seventh trump, it takes away a great deal of the deception from the first six. I'm going to begin covering that in the 15th chapter of Corinthians, where the subject and the object are that if you believe Christ rose from the dead. Now, that had never happened before, let's say, basically. A man defeating death, that is to say, Yeshua, Christ. He said... If you don't believe that, then why in the world would you be baptized in a dead man's name? I know a lot of people misunderstand that particular verse, and they baptize the dead in the 29th verse of this 15th chapter. But the whole point is this. He was speaking of that fact and that time, and he goes into a great mystery in this 15th chapter. And he breaks down life, basically, and as much as he explains it as a grain of corn or wheat, that there is one body, which is to say the flesh, that must die, and it must um, deteriorate, as a grain of corn does, but from it a new embryo sparks forth. And he used that analogy then to go into the two bodies of man, and that's something you must clearly understand. Every man, uh, no gender now, mankind, has two bodies. You have the flesh body, which your old voice can get a little hoarse and they get old and they deteriorate. But within that flesh body is a beautiful spiritual body. It is your self or your soul, I like to call it. I think that translates it better than probably any other way that your soul is yourself. Now remember what Christ said in the book of Matthew. Fear not those that can destroy this flesh body, but he who can also cause your inner body, the spiritual body, that is to say the soul, yourself, to perish, to not exist anymore. And then he goes into this terrestrial and the celestial bodies, which is to say the flesh and the spirit body. And he makes it very clear that the first man is fleshly, which is natural, but it's raised spiritual, or it's changed into a spiritual being, a spiritual body. And with all that foundation having been laid, or laying, he, we come to the 51st verse, and I want to pick up there, and I want to talk about the seventh trump. Listen very carefully. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, and it reads... Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, when Paul shows you a mystery, there's something, there is some depth, so you want to sharpen up. We shall not all sleep. That's to say, we've been talking about death and the fact that if you, in this 15th chapter, and the fact that if you don't believe Christ rose from the dead, you're wasting your time calling yourself a Christian. It would be nonsense, for you don't want to follow a dead man. But no, quite the contrary, Christ lives. We're not all even that are in the flesh, going to die in that sense. But we shall all be changed. 
Now, this word change does not mean we're all going to heaven. It doesn't mean we're all going to overcome. It simply means the body is going to be changed. You have a second part to this that Paul has gone an entire chapter here up to this 51st verse explaining to you that there's two bodies. You're going to change from the flesh into the spiritual body. Maybe to walk into the lake of fire. But it's going to happen to all. For it will be 1,000 years from this particular verse until the great white throne judgment. And all will make that judgment. And that is with the exception of a very small handful of fallen angels, which you have no need to be concerned about. If you're on earth today, you're certainly not one of those, for they're in captivity. So let it be no mystery to you that all are changed. Don't get this dumb idea of the churches in your head that this means all are going to be changed into a heavenly body, or they're going to heaven. And if, if you allow yourself to be uh, to fall into that old tradition of man, church osity, I'll call it, then you're already deceived. All will be changed. This corruptible body will put on an incorruptible body. But the question is, what about your soul? All right? With that thought in mind, listen carefully, shall be changed. 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, there's only one last trump. You will have uh, some people that try to juggle things to fit their own little schemes or plans or church. Last in the Greek means the further, farthest one out, meaning it can only be that one. It's called God's trump. It's called the trump of God. It's called the Lord's trump. Why? Because that's the trump he returns at. And this is when this great change takes place. For the trumpet, the meaning that particular one, shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The dead, those that are even spiritually dead, for when you uh, look at the soul, you're either alive in Christ or you're dead spiritually. It has nothing to do with the death of the flesh, and you must come with me now and stop thinking about flesh for a moment and think about the other body that was described in this 15th chapter. That is to say, that great spiritual body. All changed. Why? For the millennium and the judgment. Everybody, sinners, saints, those in between, everybody's going to be judged. And inasmuch as flesh cannot stand in the presence of God, and all shall, the flesh is put off. Incorruptible means a body that can... I, I would advise it's very, it's very edifying to check it out in the Greek in your strong concordance. It means it can wither. It can get sick. It can grow old. It can wrinkle. But to put on... Um, but to do away with... Um, with uh, the corruptible and put on incorruption is a beautiful thing. It's a body that will not wither, will not uh, um, uh, grow old. And again, I, I might have confused some in saying this, this, that incorruptible, check it out, and you, you'll find that that, is, uh, 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 that it is not perishable, that it can live forever. But also look up the word corruptible as it will be used in the next verse. 53. For this corruptible, this flesh body, that's what Paul was in at this time, this flesh body must put on incorruption. And this mortal, now we're talking about a different subject. This mortal, what does mortal mean in the Greek? Liable to die. This one that is liable to die must put on immortality, deathlessness. Impossible to die because you're alive in Christ. Eternally so. So, Paul here brings the conclusion of the changing of not only the body, but of your soul. 
what does it mean? A spiritually dead soul. That means a soul out of Christ is definitely mortal, meaning it's liable to die. Again, I would reiterate, fear not he who can destroy your flesh body, but he that can cause your soul to perish, that that is mortal, to be done away with. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, when this old corruptible body has been changed to our beautiful spiritual body, and this mortal, let's to say yourself, this soul, shall have put on immortality, that is to say, to have succeeded, to have passed into spiritual completeness, to have accepted Christ. Then, why? Because he was the first that defeated death. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Whose victory? Christ's victory. And there shall be no more death for an individual that puts on immortality. And then shall be that old song, that old saying, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, verse 57, which giveth us the victory through, through what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Don't let the first six trumps fool you. Be steadfast in the truth of God's word, unmovable, undeceived, non-deceived, always abounding in the work. In what? In the work of the Lord. Do you do work for the Lord? Are you going to be accounted worthy, or are you a good for nothing? You can answer that question. In the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor... What is labor? Labor is what you do for the Lord's Word, how you support a ministry, how you witness. is not in vain. It's certainly not for nothing. You're always paid back tenfold in the Lord. So there you have it. Now, we see then that there are two bodies and that we definitely all are going to be changed into and away from this flesh body into a spiritual body. But many will be deceived through that process. And unfortunately, there's another time that Paul discusses this same subject. And if we may, I want to go there. It's in the book of Thessalonians. And we have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. How many of you have heard of that? It's the so-called rapture chapter. Now, there's just one great big problem. It's not even talking about, and the word rapture is not even involved within it. And it shows how traditions of men make void the actual subject an object that is being discussed. Now, with the groundwork having been laying there in the prior 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, let's go to this 4th chapter, 1 Thessalonians. I want to pick it up in verse 13. Let's read it. But I would not have you to be ignorant. You see, Paul does not want you to be ignorant. God does not want you to be ignorant. It would seem that perhaps some theologians would. So listen to Paul, the teacher. He doesn't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, them that are dead, dead in the flesh, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope, the, the, the heathen. Don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen are. As to where the dead are. Some of the heathen think they're out here in a hole in the ground. He says, I don't want you to think that. Now, verse 14. For if, notice there's a, there is a qualification on that. If, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe that? It's the same subject as the 15th chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Where Paul said, if you don't believe Christ rose from the dead, why, are you, why would you be baptizing the dead man's uh, 
name. Because if you don't think Christ ro arose, then you think he's dead. Actually, that's the subject and the object of this particular chapter, is that Christ, those that are asleep, you might even say where the dead are. For if you believe that Jesus died, was in the tomb, and yet rose, even so then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, there are certain champions that are in that army that Christ will bring with him at the second coming. In other words, if you believe Jesus rose from the dead, you better believe that they did too. For Christ defeated death. There's nobody out here in a hole in the ground, and their souls are not asleep. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. To accept Jesus Christ gives eternal life. Not It doesn't say in St. John chapter 3, verse 16, Well, if you believe on God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe upon him should not perish, die, but have eternal life except for that little period of time that you've got to rot in the grave. It doesn't say that. Because to be absent from this body, when this flesh dies, you're through with it. Done. But that spiritual body that Paul so aptly described, that you have two bodies. And why will God bring them with him? Because they're already with him. They're not out here in a hole in the ground. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Where does those Lord's words say that? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. By the word of God, we, he can say this. That we shall, we rather, which are alive and remain unto the coming. Until when? The coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that is to say, in no wise proceed them which are asleep, that is to say, dead in the flesh. Why? They're already gone. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 makes that very clear. The day of the Lord is the day of the last trump. You know that. I know it. And that is the day that the last trump shall sound, and it is not a trump of deception. The first five trumps, the first four trumps, are trumps of deception. The last three trumps are trumps of woe. Neither are the first four deceptive to God's elect, nor are the last three woes to God's elect, but precious moments in the word of the living God when his children shall do exploits. Okay, let's go one more verse, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the voice of what archangel? And with the trump of God. There's only one trump of God. The first six are trumps of deception, or you might even call them trumps announcing Satan's actions to God's elect. Don't ever let anyone tell you that any other than the seventh trump is the trump of God. For it is the only trump that the archangel sounds and makes a statement. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why? They're already uh, gone. Naturally, they rise first because it's the promise of God. A lot of people make a rapture theory out of that. It's not even the subject. The subject is when and whether or not you believe that Christ himself rose from the dead and you, in following him, have that same privilege. Now, there would be some that would say, well, I don't believe that's the seventh trump, and they would really show their ignorance, but to shore up, let's understand which trump it is that is God's trump and the trump that the archangel actually has a voice therein. Okay, let's go to Revelation chapter 10, verse 7 to you. Listen to it very carefully. 
but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. That's the archangel's that voice, as was stipulated in that uh, verse in Thessalonians. When he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. In other words, the prophets declare and say when the end would be, when all the prophecies would be fulfilled. There's only one end, my friend. And that's when Christ returns to this earth and, and boots Satan into the pit. And we have the privilege of serving the living God when the seventh angel sounds. I'm, I'm not going to let you overlook, though, the days of the voice of the seventh angel. And in 1 Thessalonians, it states, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, announcing that exact moment. Don't let a man, a human being, rob you from your work in this word of God. Don't let a man, a human being, take away from you the reward of knowing God's Word and for the privilege of working for Him rather than some people taking a cross-cut saw and sawing this Word into so many fables, such as the fact that this really isn't the seventh trump. This is the trump that announces the great rapture. There can only be one last, my friend. And then comes Antichrist. This is where the deception comes in. Because the first six trumps detail the actions of Antichrist when God's true followers shall witness against him as it is written in the 13th chapter of Mark. You see... The reason the first six are deception trumps, if you believe any church or group or theologian that would tell you this is not the voice of the seventh angel or the trump of the seventh angel, you're already so far deceived that you're not going to make it, friend. Your church is going to lead you to Antichrist. For he will say, as Christ has stated he would in the 13th chapter of Mark. I've come to take you home. For Christ said, not maybe Antichrist would come before he did, but the very fact he would, that is to say the false Christ, would come before the true Christ would. So, that's why it's so important that you know the subject of this fourth chapter of Thessalonians. It's where the dead are that they're already with him. If you believe Christ rose from the dead, and if you don't, stop calling yourself a Christian because you would serve a dead Savior if that were the case. You know, you know that he rose. So, naturally, the dead in Christ rise first. Why? They're already there. We can't, we can't go to him right now uh, physically in the flesh because flesh cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But they can. Why? They've put aside the flesh body and have put on the spiritual. Now, verse 17 in that fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Then, what does then mean? Then means at the seventh trump. Then means at the voice of the seventh angel. That same voice that you'll read of in the 11th chapter of Revelation when the actual seventh trump sounds with the telescope of time focusing on daily events, hourly events, better said, then we which are alive, this is that thing that happens at the twinkle of the eye, and remain shall be caught up. Now, that's where your rapture doctrine comes from. Caught up in what? Caught up together with them in the clouds. This is a colloquial saying. You'll find Paul using it in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 where we're still in flesh bodies. And he says, we're going to gather in a huge cloud and run a race. It just means a, a large group, a large congregation. It has nothing to do with air clouds. Christ
Christ is returning here at the seventh trump to meet the Lord in the air. And I dare you to translate this word air back in the Greek, and you'll find it's the breath of life body, which means the spiritual body. When? At the instant, at the twinkle of the eye, at the change. The very first word of this 17th verse, then, meaning the seventh trump, not until. And if you listen to any garbage from any theologian that anything shall happen before that point, the Christ you'll be worshiping is Antichrist. Wake up. The hour is late. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, meaning this is the last because the Lord will be with us. Death will have been defeated. Grave, where is your victory when it has none? Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort in what way? Comfort each other in the fact that at that seventh trump, you know, Christ is going to return. The beauty of um, knowing God's Word is that if you were to go now to the 11th chapter of Revelation, you would find there that it is stipulated that three and a half days before the seventh trump sounds, the two witnesses will be slain in the streets of Jerusalem. Did you hear what I said? That's how good the Word is to you. I know some people would say, no man knows the hour of time. Well, that's right. But in the book of Daniel, it says in the end times, the wise shall understand the season. And they do. For God's Word makes it very clear. Yes, in the 11th chapter of that great book of uh, Revelation, just following that 10th chapter where the voice of the... Any theologian, that anything shall happen before that point, the Christ you'll be worshiping is Antichrist. Wake up. The hour is late. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, meaning this is the last because the Lord will be with us. Death will have been defeated. Grave, where is your victory when it has none? Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort in what way? Comfort each other in the fact that at that seventh trump, you know Christ is going to return. The beauty of um, knowing God's Word is that if you were to go now to the 11th chapter of Revelation, you would find there that it is stipulated that three and a half days before the seventh trump sounds, the two witnesses will be slain in the streets of Jerusalem. Did you hear what I said? That's how good the word is to you. I know some people would say, no man knows the hour of time. Well, that's right. But in the book of Daniel, it says in the end times, the wise shall understand the season. And they do. For God's word makes it very clear. Yes, in the 11th chapter of that great book of uh, Revelation, just following that 10th chapter where the voice of the seventh angel, that archangel, it's prophecy, that voice of that archangel, that you will know exactly, that is to say, not to the instant, but the day you will know, at that moment, not until, when the two witnesses are slain in the pata in the Greek, the um, uh, arena, there will be three and one half days, and then shall be re the return of the true Christ. When? At the seventh trump. Do you know why all the other six are deception trumps, or trumps of deception, announcing deception? Because Christ will not have returned. And they speak of that locust army which is to say Satan's army, when he comes as Messiah to save the world. the world. Who will you be saved by? Well, any Christian that loves the Lord and serves him is going to be saved. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's just say if 
the Antichrist returns first, and a good Christian church has not studied the Word of God, and this Antichrist says, I've come to rapture you all out of here. He's supernatural. The miracles he performs are so spectacular, according to the 13th chapter of Mark and Revelation chapter 13, that even the elect are going to be deceived if they're not very careful because human beings are not accustomed to that that is supernatural. His divine miracles in the sight, Revelation 13, verse 12, in the sight of man on this earth, to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. That's why that I just wanted to visit with you about this to remind you, as Paul stated in his closing verses of that great 15th chapter of 1 Thessalonians, be steadfast. That means stand fast in what you believe. Be aware. Read God's Word for yourself. Don't listen to this man or any other man without checking him out in the very manuscripts themselves. Because there will be no man standing between you and God at the great white throne government. A judgment, rather. It is a government. It's his kingdom. There will be no one standing between you and God. And... What good is it going to do you to say, well, my, you don't understand, God. My whole church thought there would be a rapture. But at the seventh trump, we were going to fly away. I didn't read your word. And he's going to say, condemned. No excuse. Because you know the word and you've been taught. Will they go to hell? Well... What is the penalty if you were to worship that first Messiah, which is to say to worship Satan, though you did it in ignorance? Though the millennium comes, and there's going to be some very disciplined teaching. For God himself sent the spirit of slumber on some to protect their innocency. But no one that calls themselves Christians could ever be pleased with the fact that they had not read this letter that God sent us in love with the simplicity in which we've covered that there are seven trumps and Christ isn't returning until the last trump and makes it very clear it's the last trump even in this so-called rapture scriptures. And what's your excuse then for having worshipped Antichrist? if you're not real careful. And that's what I'm saying. I'll tell you something. If you're comfortable with what men say, well, listen to men. But I tell you, rather choose God and let him lead you, for it is he that shall judge you. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a minute, won't you please?